I consider the Mali Empire to be the greatest empire in all of West African history. Its legendary kings and influence in the medieval world is very well documented. We know that the Malayans sailed the Atlantic Ocean well before the journey of Christopher Columbus, but what about other maritime events like naval battles? <laughs> What up African world, it's Home Team here, and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. By supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and supporting this content. If you like access to full courses and sources, or you simply want to show your support, you may do so by clicking the Patreon link in the description box below. Before we get into any potential naval battles from West Africa, let's first talk about Mandinka military history and also the geopolitical climate of 15th century Western Africa. As he began to consolidate Mandinka dominion over large portions of West Africa, the founder of the Mali Empire, Sanjata Keita, asserted authority over most of the Mande people who had once been part of the Wagadu state. With his new capital at Niani, located in the southern savanna of the upper Niger, Sanjata directed the expansion of Mali and became its manza or ruler. To acquire more horses, an army under his general, Teramagan, was sent west to conquer the kingdom of Jolof in what is now Senegal, and also established the tributary state of Kabu in present-day Guinea-Bissau. Another army under Fakoli Karoma went south to conquer the upper Senegal River and the area bordering the forest. After Sanjata's death around 1255, his son, Manza Uwali, extended the empire east by conquering the important trading center of Gao on the Niger River. Mali developed a standing army, which was actually pretty rare in that time. It was centered on nobles who commanded cavalry armed with lances, swords, and bows, and regional infantry units equipped with spears and bows. According to Arab sources, at the height of its power in the early to mid-1300s, Mali maintained an army of 100,000 men, including 10,000 cavalry, most of which were at the capital and garrison towns across the empire. Early in Mali's history, cavalrymen would bring their slaves on campaign to provide logistics, but interestingly enough, they forbade them to fight. Later, however, slaves were increasingly mobilized as bow-armed light infantry who employed poisoned and flaming arrows and were adept at fighting in swamps and forests where cavalry were essentially useless. Mali's military command was divided into northern and southern regions. The military's purpose was to keep tributary states in line and protect the trans saharan trade from which the Manza collected tax. After a civil war in the 1270s, Manza Sakuri, a former slave, took over the empire, reasserted its authority over rebellious vassals such as Gao, and expanded west by conquering the Tekrur Kingdom in what is now Senegal and Mauritania. He also expanded north by subjugating the Tauric ruled copper producing town of Takeda in present day Niger. By Sakura's death around 1300, Mali ruled a vast empire stretching from the Atlantic coast in the west to the Niger Bend in the east. Ironically, Manza Musa's journey to Mecca actually benefited Mandinka armies, as historian Robin Law speculates that his strip may have stimulated the growth of an improved cavalry tradition in the region as he brought back larger breed Egyptian horses equipped with saddles and bridles. Unfortunately for Mali, during the late 1300s and early 1400s, the empire was weakened by a series of secession disputes that prompted tributary states to break away. The Mandinka princes fought each other harder than perhaps any foreign opponent, and thus, in 1360, the Jolof kingdom in the west regained independence. The Maasai horsemen from states south and present-day Burkini Faso raided Mali's towns during the late 1300s and early 1400s. In the 1370s, a Mali army was sent to suppress rebellion in the east. It subdued Takeda but failed to retake Gao, a failure that would really affect the course of Mandinka statehood later. During the 1430s, Mali lost control over much of the trans saharan trade when the desert Tauric captured Timbuktu and Walata and Jene became independent. In the early 15th century, the Portuguese began to make some inroads on their former Moorish masters. They began taking coastal Moroccan towns and started to flex their muscles. Much later, Portuguese intrusion eventually led to the so-called 
Battle of the Three Kings, in which the Portuguese king attempted to help a deposed Moroccan sultan against the new sultan. Now, this is where we get into the little known naval battle between the Mali Empire and the Portuguese. This naval encounter, though brief, was historic. It was the first time any African empire fought a European force on sea. In the 1440s and 1450s, seaborne Portuguese began slave raids along the coasts of present-day Senegal and Gambia. The earliest West African European military contest waged on the Senegambian coast in the mid 15th century clearly revealed the superiority of poisoned arrows over the armor that Portuguese marines wore in the period. Because the Portuguese accounts of the encounters constantly reveal the fear that they had of poisoned archery. Given the musket's general inaccuracy, musketry was most effective when masses of troops confronted each other and less effective when soldiers advanced in dispersed order as they often did in Africa. Early reports from the Portuguese indicated that the Africans carried much lighter armor, but that Africans poisoned their arrows, making even a small scratch anywhere on the body potentially fatal. Against this weapon, the Portuguese had absolutely no response, and in 1447, Nuno Tristao, leading a landing party near the West African coast, lost 19 of 22 men of the party to poison arrows and had to limp back to Portugal with a skeleton crew. Other Portuguese mariners met stiff resistance, often even before they landed, by Mali's vassals who piled into large naval craft that outnumbered the invaders while constantly attacking with the dreaded poison arrows. By 1456, the Portuguese crown realized they couldn't sustain this at all. They only had a few captives and had caused a substantial toll in Portuguese lives. Deciding that they needed to repair damaged relations with the Africans, they dispatched Diogo Gomes a nobleman and a member of the royal household to negotiate with the political authorities for a new start in West Africa. Gomez took two voyages to Guinea in 1456 and in 1462, meeting with political elites and winning agreements for peaceful trade. In the following years, as Portuguese caravels reached farther and farther along the coast, they showed that they had learned from the lessons Mali taught them, not even attempting to raid the coast. They went immediately to establish diplomatic contacts with the political authorities they met, inviting them to send ambassadors to Lisbon and encouraging them to have their younger relatives educated in Portugal with the hope that this might spread Christianity and create alliances. In these negotiations, the Portuguese treated the African rulers with most of the same courtesies they extended to European monarchs, even those such as on the Gold Coast who ruled quite small domains. I find it ironic that vassals of the Mali state not only outright defeated the Portuguese at naval battles, often using shallow draught boats, but they literally saved other African regions further south from Portuguese aggression. In other words, the Mali Empire made Portugal respect the sovereignty of the entire West and Central African coast and delayed extensive slave raiding for quite some time. That's pretty remarkable. Also, the Portuguese inability to even land on the coast at times tells us a lot about the naval capacity of the Mali Empire. I imagine the Portuguese weren't really expecting a naval encounter, but were forced to have one. There is so much to explore concerning the naval history of West Africa. Not many people even know that various African states had viable navies, the biggest perhaps being the Songhai Navy under Sunni Ali. Well, I'm all out, guys. If you like these videos and want to help in its continued production, consider supporting the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace.